When my dad was dying, there was a nurse whom I loved. You know those nurses who hold you during hard times? In, um, in the ICU, and I said to her, what makes you so amazing? And she was probably about my age, and she said, you know, I'm probably the last generation of nurse who knows the difference between what is and what should be. And I thought about public education. And when I think about today, I think we are a reminder of 35 years since Central Park East first opened. An amazing, an amazing accomplishment. And we are a reminder that we have work to do not only to restore the public and public education, not only to remember that democracy is at stake, not only to fight privatization, but to educate the next generation of educators. Because I worry like that nurse that they might not know the history in which their careers walk. 22 years ago and two months, I sat in an auditorium like this at Brandeis High School, and I watched graduation. And some of you might have read a book that I wrote about that called Framing Dropouts. And at that graduation, I cried for the 200 or so students who walked across the stage but I also cried for the thousands of students who never made it across the stage. I knew it was a building of 3,000, and I knew that graduation held about 200 bodies. During my year at Brandeis, I learned that it was normative for black and brown bodies to disappear, and very few folks were outraged. I, I also realized that if this were a white middle class school, it would have been shut down long ago. So when I heard last spring that Brandeis was being resurrected, was being closed and reopened as four small schools, it piqued my interest. And then I learned, as Pedro suggested this morning, that there were four small but very different schools that were opening in that building. One is a credit recovery school. Two are what are called non-selective schools, seemingly run by fantastic educators but put together in haste over the summer, and then there is the Frank McCourt School for Journalism. All right, Frank McCourt seems to have lots of Upper West Side symphony space partnerships. Are you getting an image of the racial demographics as I speak? Um, so I, with the Center for Immigrant Families and Donna Neville, we started going to meetings about the planning for Frank McCourt, and many of us were, um, pretty dedicated to making sure that Frank McCord, in Frank's honor, in Louis Brandeis's honor, and in the history of that school, would be dedicated to the children whom Brandeis High School had failed. That is, the children of Harlem, Central and East Harlem. Recently, the Frank McCord School was listed in the high school book as having selection criteria exclusively open to threes and fours. Do you all know what threes and fours are? All right? Yeah, some of you don't because you're from out of town. In New York City, what we do is tattoo on the heads of children, whether they are one, twos, threes, and fours. Those are their standardized test scores. And we are now creating schools all over the city, particularly in gentrifying neighborhoods, only for threes and fours. When the Center for Immigrant Families and many other organizers, myself included, complained and inquired, we were told that the typical UWS parent, Upper West Side, would be scared away if the school was open to twos. But if the, we knew a two with a spark, we should let them know. So dull three, is there a two with a spark in the room? Oh, there's an old two with a spark. <laughs> we know his spark. I also went to a meeting where a consultant stood up and said, I just talked to Ann Cook, and I thought, oh, this is good. I just talked to Ann Cook about how schools need, in multiple schools in a building, they need their own autonomy. And so I was thinking that for Frank McCord, of course, our children wouldn't want to walk through a metal detector, as is the case at Brandeis. So perhaps we should use a separate entrance, right? It's astonishing to hear Ann Cook's words curdled into an apartheid-like structure for how bodies get into a building. 
We were also told, however, when we raised up the racial politics of admission, that by using ones and twos and threes and fours, these are considered demographically neutral categories. That is my point. My point is the way in which science or research or accountability is now being used as the lubricant for stratification, privatization, and containment of youth of color. In my spare time, I read a funny little journal called Critical Accounting. Critical Accounting is put together, I'm not recommending it, I'll just tell you what you need to know. Um, critical Accounting is put together by um, mostly Marxist economists and accountants, and they critically look at like the privatization of prisons and the privatization of food services. And I found a stream of articles on um, what they call accountability regimes, and that neoliberalism is being held together by a set of accountability regimes. Anybody not familiar with what that feels like in your body? Right. And this article is about how when accountability regimes, when the technical decisions get decoupled from the moral and the relational, they create the grounds for what, I guess it's an accounting term, they call administrative evil, right? That's deep, right? So there are all these accounting articles about administrative evil, and the most insidious piece of administrative evil is that no one is accountable. It's in the ether. You don't actually know where to locate your rage, your discomfort, your collusion, your resistance. Right? It's everywhere. You go to meetings and you feel like the only one who hasn't drunk the Kool-Aid. Right? But I also live in New Jersey. And New Jersey is making New York look like the most progressive public education system one could imagine. It's amazing what an election will do. So in New Jersey with my colleague Stan Karp, who is here somewhere, who, is, who has just been an amazing advocate, researcher, educator in New Jersey, for, for a couple of years we've been fighting around high stakes testing in Jersey. Jersey is one of the highest graduation rates in the country. At one point Jersey's black and Latino graduation rate was higher than New York's white graduation rate. All right, New York is, is proud to be number 48 in state graduation indexes. Um, but New York has a high stakes exam and then an alternative exam called the Special Review Assessment, the SRA. The right wing mobilized to get rid of the SRA. Um, you could imagine the rhetoric, it's a useless degree, it's a setup, it's racist to have low expectations, etc. Um, we fought hard last year, we had a real victory, we got the SRA maintained in New Jersey. Are there things that need to be done to improve Instruction in New Jersey, absolutely, we could talk about that later. All right, so we maintain this multiple pathways to graduation. Um, they kept it, but what they decided would happen is that the SRA, the task that the young people completed, would be graded not by their educators and fed back and revised and fed back and revised, much like the performance assessment here, but that it would be shipped to a place called Measurement Inc which must have been in the minds of the administrative evil people, right? So Measurement Inc., they might be very nice people, you might all be related to them, you might have stock in them, you should have stock in them. So, all right, so Measurement Inc. now takes these exams. We were told they'd be graded by teachers, right? We just learned that 70% of these exams were graded by non-certified, non-educators, Measurement Inc. staff, some of whom are college students, and we just got the results back. This is for this year's seniors, all right? Now that they have decided, and this is my second point about science, they've decided that it is objective to move the scoring from educators' hands to North Carolina, right? To measurementing staff who are these college students or who else they are. So we just got the data back. The kids who took the exam this year who are supposed to graduate in June, who have passed all of their coursework, 10% of those kids pass the English, and 30% pass the math. Now when Stan and I had a not so quiet, not so secret meeting in a diner with someone high up in the board of, the State Board of Education, what we heard 
was, see, this is evidence that those kids were graduating without the skills before. Measurement Inc. was covered in Teflon, right? The accountability goes right back to the teachers and to the students. Now, there is a fight still on. You will hear about it. Read your Atlantic City newspaper this morning. There's a big article about it. I use both of those examples to say not only have public schools been hijacked, but the notion of science has been hijacked. Right? And I am one of those nerds who actually would like to reclaim science in the same way that um, Debbie asked us to reclaim achievement. And so what I want to introduce to you are ways of thinking about democratic science, science for a public project. Um, we need to be interrupting the misuse of numbers and test scores and achievement. Even on their own terms, New York City's achievement gap is not shrinking. Sorry, the gaps aren't shrinking. The discharge rates go beneath the dropout data and look at the discharge rates. It's a swollen group of black and brown bodies who do not show up in the denominator. Do you know what I mean? If you don't, I'll explain it later. The point is, that's the room. The rubber room is for teachers. The discharge category is for kids they don't want to have to contend with, right? So the notion of taking education and science back feels very important to me. And this afternoon's session is dedicated to the reclaiming of research. But I just want to make my boldest sentence, and then I'll have some images, and then I'm going to be joined on stage with some colleagues to give you a sense of what public science might look like. I want to say that at the intersection of structural racism and profit and reclaiming the public sector for elites, districts are now using what they call evidence-based data. I hope I don't offend anybody, but I feel like public education is to evidence as the church is to sex. It's a fetish and it's hiding a lot more than each of those institutions' wishes was revealed. And yet and amazingly, all of you have created work in the cracks, right? And you have created a movement for democratic education. And what I would like us to do this afternoon is to imagine evidence-based support so that you get to ask the real questions of teaching and learning and the role of schools in democracy. Because we are watching each of those be hijacked by a fetishistic com commitment to testing, test companies um, and publication houses. And just a footnote on RCTs, randomized clinical trials, anybody? Getting saddled with that? All right, so we should have a workshop on RCTs and what's wrong with that model. Part of what's wrong with RCTs, randomly assigning people to conditions, is A, the only RCT I would like us to do is to randomly assign people to poverty. All right? Let's randomly assign people to poverty and see how well we all do. All right? The second thing that's wrong with RCTs are the, the organizations best equipped to launch RCTs are publishing houses and pharmaceuticals. Because they can randomly assign people to a condition the problem is education is not a variable. It's not a thing you can, it's a set of relationships that grow in a community, in a space between adults and children, between children and children, about work for a lifetime. It is not a variable one can lay on top of um, random communities. So here's my call for public science. And I wanna say that I think we have four streams of work that we need to be doing simultaneously. All right, and I'm trying. I'm a multitasker. All right, so the first stream of work at, that, that we need to be taking up is unfortunately one that consumes a lot of our time, and that has to do with challenging the lies and the myths. All right, so there are lots of people doing research on what's really going on in charter schools. All right, again, some of my best friends are charter schools. That is not the point. The point is they're being sold as, as a magic wand for public education. Some of them are great, lots of them are mediocre, and a whole bunch are crappy, right? So, so we need to be doing research, the, the kind of work that Juan was talking about this morning of following the money. 
That's really important. We need to be looking at the perverse consequences of high stakes testing and who's being hurt. Not only the English language learners where we're seeing um, dropout rates elevate, um, but we're watching principals lying about test scores, right? And now we have compliance officers studying who's cheating. That was all predictable, right? The perversions are predictable. So we need one stream of work that unfortunately just challenges the lies and the myths, which is a lot of what we're currently having to do in New Jersey. The second stream of work is to be documenting the forgotten alternatives. Um, I don't want to say that CPE is a forgotten alternative, but I do want to say we need to be documenting the work of all the schools that you're doing right now. Because the kinds of practices that are being engaged by these schools are unfortunately not being taught in um, lots of ed schools, right? So, and the archive that you're going to be building in Indiana will be a great opportunity for us to document the forgotten alternatives. Um, the eight-year study is an important piece of our history. And the, the longitudinal work that people like David Benzman, Laurie Chagé, Martha Foote have done tracking the graduates of the consortium schools. You know, Laurie Chagé's work followed kids into college and what she found, the consortium school kids. And first, they said three amazing, many amazing things. One is that teaching in higher ed really sucks compared to consortium schools. Right? They're used to good teaching, and suddenly they have teachers who aren't very good teachers. Um, the second is that when it comes time to writing a paper, they're fine, no sweat. They're so surprised that other kids are having a hard time with papers because they've actually got the skills. But the third is that what consortium kids have when they get to college is the best predictor of graduating after social class, which is the capacity to find an adult who can help you when you hit a bump in the road. And that's what you guys deliver. You teach them to revise, to take feedback, and to seek feedback. We need that kind of work to understand how the teaching and learning that gets engaged in your schools lives in the bodies of young people over time, even those who might take 30 years to graduate from CUNY. The third kind of work is the kind of work you'll hear about in a moment. Um, we've been studying what we call circuits of dispossession and privilege, that is, the ways in which um, money, bodies, and opportunities in the public sector are being realigned by race and class lines. These are circuits of dispossession and privilege. So Brandeis closes and reopens as a school for Upper West Side kids who are not considered the kids that Brandeis was served before, right? The typical Upper West Side kids. So it's being remade. Right? Now, when we close down schools across the city, we reopen them as either charters or selective schools that don't allow local kids in. We then threaten to deny them metro cards to get to school elsewhere. What are we setting up? How would one not be paranoid that this was an opportunity simply to funnel black and brown kids into prison? We, um, you, you'll hear about a project that we've been involved in called Polling for Justice, and, and it's, my, it's my fourth example. But it's a participatory action research project where we've trained young people to create a, a survey of other young people in New York City. So they're surveying young people about justice and injustice in education, healthcare, and criminal justice. You'll hear from some of the youth researchers and performers about that work. One of the pieces of data, though, that we've gotten, um, and Leo Casey was very helpful in documenting this, we have maps, some of which you'll see, that show where kids are running into trouble with cops, right? And we have a data set of, as you'll see, kids who like love school, love their teachers. It's a very funny little data set. Not much sex, not much drugs. They all want to be lawyers and get PhDs, and they believe in youth organizing, and youth should make a difference, but 60% of them in the last six months have had a negative encounter with a cop, right? So we've created maps of where they're encountering, um, where they're having negative police encounters, and then we overlaid them on which are the schools that have high discharge and dropout rates. And then unfortunately, we could easily, with, with some help, 
overlay where are the schools that they're closing and reopening as charters. Right? So money has been invested in communities locating cops inside communities with high discharge rates, and then those are the very communities where the last public option is being closed down for kids. Call me paranoid. All right, so the, the fourth piece of work that we want you to entertain is what we call participatory action research. And if you're interested in hearing more about that, come to our workshop afterwards, which I think actually might be in here. Participatory action research simply takes seriously the fact that people who pay the highest price for injustice have a kind of knowledge about the research and the questions that should be interrogated. So dropouts know a lot about what goes on in schools. Young people who have spent time in prison have a lot of knowledge about the criminal justice system. Kids who have been in foster care know a lot about what's wrong with our structure for supporting families and what's wrong with the foster care system. So it presumes knowledge sits in the soil of injustice. Right? It, it queers the notion of where do you find expertise. It challenges the idea that you've got to send the scores for the tests from New Jersey to North Carolina to get a valid reading. In fact, to the contrary, it says, guess what? Teachers are really experts on teaching and learning. Teachers actually know. You don't have to move, even teachers in North Carolina, I presume, right? So participatory action research presumes that young people, many of whom you will meet in a moment, that young people are the experts on the public sector. Adolescents are the only group where most of them are contending with public institutions. The rest of us, when we grow up, we get a private doctor, we might take a cab, we might go to private university. But as teens, they are fully reliant on the public sector. And so we've basically done a youth census of how's the public sector working for you? And as you'll hear the data, um, some parts of it are working very well. Some parts are quite problematic. But participatory action research presumes that the people who are on the ground have incredible knowledge and actually the further away from the ground you get, the more tainted your point of view is, right? So not being an educator and not being in a school really is more like glycoma than clear vision. You are blurred by the distance. Sorry uh, for glycoma folks. Um, but the distance is a distortion. It's not a form of objectivity. And so much of what is being said about teachers' capacity to know young people or parents' capacity to know young people as though that's a bias and sending the tests to North Carolina is a form of clear vision. So my last point about participatory action research is that we are doing this work toward what, we're, uh, what Maddie Fox would call a politics of solidarity. That is, we are interested in bringing young people together with educators, together with families, to do research together, not separately, not to get pit against each other. Because one of my most um, haunting headlines, and I have so many as you can imagine, was recently when parents in Detroit called for imprisonment of teachers who didn't increase students' test scores, right? That's a really complicated headline, right? It's complicated for so many reasons. A, that in the United States, people think the only way to get accountability is to lock someone up. B, that parents are so desperate that they can only imagine that locking up teachers would change the conditions in their kids' schools. C, that people have been so sold on the idea that teachers are the culprits here. And D, that they think test scores are what measures, they, we, we have so deluded a generation to believe that test scores measure. So we are really interested in supporting schools, families, organizing groups, and young people in developing participatory action research projects where the questions are born in the soil of injustice, but there's a strong action a component that will challenge injustice. So in the spirit of W.E.B. Du Bois, who actually had a whole pageantry genre. He used to perform his sociology and history in the streets as a way to activate 
the social imagination, I bring you Polling for Justice, which is a group of youth and adult researchers and performers dedicated to provoking your political and educational imaginations. Maddie Fox and colleagues, you're on. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Researchy Researcher. Um, I recently published a, a new study in the American Journal on Adolescence um, looking at the experience of New York at risk. Um, uh, uh, um, about New York at risk teens who are joining gangs. Um, in this study, I found that. Hi, my name is Mamie and I'm from Poland for Justice. I am a researcher who does research with other youth in the communities. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, so what I have found that uh, adolescents are, are very troubled. Um, the, the research has shown that, um, that one out of 10 um, doesn't know um, which way to, to, to even cross the street. Um, how do Hi, how are you? You okay? Yes. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Jessica, and I'm also part of Public for Justice, and we do research on public health, education, and criminal justice. It's very cute. They do research papers. Great. Um, how old are you? 18. 18. High school? Yes. I'm a, I have a doctorate. Thanks. Um, uh, we do participation action research also. That's when you do research on other youth because we believe we are the experts of our lives, not you. Okay, um, well, uh, my study was published um, about uh, three months ago. Um, and uh, I found that after years of research, there's more. Um, my name is Darius Francis, and I'm also part of Poland for Justice. And between 2008 and 2009, we collected over a thousand surveys from New York City youth. Thousand? Yeah. That's a lot. Well, um, I. Okay. Um, more. Hi, I'm Niara, and we use performing arts to show our data on education. Interactions with the police and other youth experiences. We share our data with you today with the hope that you won't just listen, but be inspired to take action. Action? But in my, in my paper, um, I, 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 I public. Uh, Hi, my name is Maddie. I'm a Poland for Justice researcher too. And in the spirit of action, if you can't hear or see anything today as we're presenting, move your body so you can get closer. We'll be using the stage. Darius. Hi again. As people, we all have knowledge and knowledge that we can share with each other. So why don't you come and learn what we learned? The Polling for Justice study. Here you can see where all the survey takers are from in New York City. This is the demographics of the youth who took our survey. Over 1,110 youth from all over New York City took the survey. 69% of youth in our survey plan on getting a master's degree, doctoral degree, or being a doctor or a lawyer. I plan on opening my own restaurant and to do that I need education and for that I have to go to college. And I plan on becoming a police officer so with that I need to go to college. <laughs> and I want to become a nurse so who says I do need education. 
90% of the youth of our survey feel somewhat or very hopeful about the future. Ninety-four percent of students care about getting good grades in school, and 89 percent feel their teachers have high expectations of them and say that teachers help, help them when they don't understand something. Sixty-four percent of students say that in their school, talking back or acting rudely towards teachers, six, 63 percent feel bored in school and 49% say there's too much class time spent on getting ready to pass the regents. Sometimes having, sometimes having a hard time with school comes with feelings of depression. In our data, for youth who ever dropped out or were pushed out of school, 23.7% feel like life wasn't worth living. I feel so alone. Nobody sees me. Nobody knows me. <laughs> we asked youth we asked youth about interactions with police we asked about positive police contact negative sexual police contact negative physical contact legal and verbal police contact 61% of youth in the Bronx, 58% of youth in Brooklyn reported negative police contact. Males report more negative contact with police than females. Youth who identify as LGBTQ report high levels of negative police contact interaction. In the Bronx, 87.5% of LGBTQ youth have had negative experiences with police, and 69% of youth in Brooklyn have had negative experiences with police. I already have two strikes against me. I'm black and I'm gay. 65% of youth who are black and Latino have reported being targeted by police as compared to 26% of Asian, South Asian, or Pacific Islanders and 43% of white youth. When's it gonna stop? When is it gonna stop? When is it gonna stop? And what are you gonna do about it? 